preach almost every Sunday night to our youth ministry. They're a pastor here at East Coast Christian Center. And uh, Christian, who's going to be preaching in a second, uh, he's an incredible friend of mine. He's somebody I've known for quite a long time. Uh, and I've seen just different seasons of his life. Each and every season, I've noticed something about him, and it's still true today. You know, in, in a way, each one of us represents a small part of Jesus. Like, God gives us gifts and talents, and together we are the body of Christ. But each of us represents a piece and a part. And Pastor Christian represents Jesus in a way that he's relentless. He's got relentless energy. His attitude is relentless. He's always taking steps forward. He's always moving forward. He's, he's an encouraging person. And no matter it seems like a challenge or even a mistake in life, he's willing to overcome that challenge. He's willing to get up and move forward again. And he's relentless like Jesus. Because Jesus never, ever gave up on anybody. He doesn't give up and he didn't quit. He went to the cross. He died. He rose again. And still today, the love of Christ is relentless in people's lives. And I just want you to welcome Pastor Christian, an awesome friend of mine, and a pastor at staff here. Give him a huge welcome. Show him some love. Love you, brother. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Come on, can you give a bigger hand to Jesus before we get started? That is so good. I want to start off just with some honor. I want to give a shout out to Pastor Matt and Pastor Jessica just for pouring your lives out and all that you've done. Pastor Matt mentioned it as we go back. It's 20 years that we've been friends last year. Or next year will be 20 years. And it's amazing just thinking about how my life has been enriched. I can truly say this, that I'm a better husband. I'm a better father. I'm a better man of God, really, because of our friendship. So thank you. Can you put your hands together for our pastor and all that you guys? I'm blessed to get to be here. I'm going to pray, and then I'm, we're going to get into it. Are you guys excited? Yeah. yeah. Father, I thank you for the privilege and the honor, the opportunity to get to speak today. We never take it for granted to be able to share the word of God. Thank you that we can all take one more step towards you in obeying the call in our lives and to discover the plans that you have for us. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. Amen. All right. Pastor Matt and Pastor Dan have been sharing on the We See a Church series. We're a couple of weeks into it, and over the last few weeks, they have talked about our legacy offering, which is coming up. And I want you to know that the first $25,000 that we give for our legacy offering is going to be helping children that are at risk. I love this. If we're going to find a people group to protect, it should be children. So these different areas you see on the screen, we're going to be giving the first $5,000 each to these five different areas. So the first one being foster kids and families. We've really developed a friendship with that community and that group in Brevard County. The next one being Mike and, Platt, Mike and Pat Black Ministries in Guatemala, that they have a feeding program. And oftentimes the only meat that they get in their diet is what we feed them each week through this program. It's amazing. Also, child trafficking prevention here locally in Brevard County. You know, it's great to do it around the world, but we're doing it right here. The TNT 3.0 Youth Intern Program. Come on, students, make some noise. This is our program inside of East Coast where this next generation are being raised up to really be world changers and to provide a better space for them and for them to feel like this is my home. And then last, Celebrate Recovery, which is an amazing ministry that helps people overcome hurts and hangups, which is really protecting children and families too. So that's very exciting. That's the first $25,000 that's going towards that. And then the remainder, this is very exciting, is gonna go towards our new building. We're gonna be breaking ground very soon. So on the weekends of November 15th and 22nd, we're gonna be taking up the legacy offering. And I wanna remind you that people are our legacy and that we are one church in many locations. We have this illustration with the five chairs saying with Parkway, Vieira, Coco, Online, Avenue. And then we're one church in many locations and we're helping make that happen. So just a reminder of that. I wanna get into the message. I'm gonna be tackling the middle portion of our vision of East Coast. We have it on the walls and you can see it all over the place is that we believe in one savior, one step, and one soul. And today I wanna to talk about one step of what that looks like. The true trajectory can be changed by one simple step. And Pastor Matt had a great illustration recently that he used that many of us started off 2020 
thinking that this year was gonna be like a 5K. Anybody here ever run a 5K before? Come on, show us some love. If you haven't, put your hand up. I'm gonna recruit you. We do a 5K for the church that raises money for our youth ministry next February 14th. You need to show up and do the 5K. So one thing we know about running is everybody loves to pick on runners. They love to be like, why do you do that? So I've got some funny memes here we're gonna put on the screen. This one's classic, I love it. The first one is, this is what I feel like when I run. This is what I'm pretty sure I actually look like when I'm out there doing it. Anybody relate to that? The next one, this is the most popular running sticker of all times. Instead of the, hey, 5K or 13.1 or 26.2, this is 0.0, .0 I don't run. That is sold more than any other. Then the next one is similar. It says, but seriously good for you. <laughs> That's how most of us feel about it. But I know running can be such a great parallel to our lives. And when Pastor Matt made that example recently, he shared it with the church, is he said it felt like 2020 was gonna be a 5K. And we all kind of had our minds wrapped around it. We're like, 2020, you're a vision, I can do this, I know what to expect. And then COVID hit, it quickly shifted from a 5K to a marathon, or for some of us, it felt like a 100 mile race, like just this insurmountable, never ending event that kept going. Anybody relate to that? But you're like, when is this thing gonna end? And I'm uniquely qualified to understand that example. I think it's some brain damages. I've run some fast 5Ks, but I've also run a 100 mile foot race. They just felt like it went on and on and on forever. So when he made that example, I'm like, bro, I know what you're talking about, is that I did my race in the Ocala National Forest on a 25 mile loop in the woods. And you get out there, and the thing about a 100 mile race is you have to decide, I can't look at the whole thing. I can't worry about the 25th mile, the 50th mile, the 75th. I programmed my watch where all I could see was the next mile. I'm just going one mile at a time. And it was crazy. I, I got done with the first loop, and I come back, and I'm getting more fluid and hydration. And I noticed that my watch doesn't say 25. It's like 26 and change. And I'm like, young at the race director, I'm like, Hey, this race is long. He goes, don't worry about it. Just keep going. I'm like, I don't want to run 104 miles. This thing is too long. And I'm like freaking out a little bit because in a 100 mile race, the ultimate goal for most people is to go under 24 hours. When you do that, you get a special belt buckle. Instead of like a normal medal that people love to wear, they go belt buckles because it's like, come on, this is tough. And so I was determined. I was like, I'm going to get that sub 24 hour buckle, even if they have to like pull me off in an ambulance, I'm gonna do this thing. And so as I'm running this race and I'm seeing this extra mile, I'm like, that is a lot of extra miles at the end of this thing. But I ended up pushing in the last literally three or four miles. I ran as hard as I could. And I was so proud to tell you that I finished it in 23 hours and 35 minutes. Come on. I got my special belt buckle that I wear almost every single day. What's so funny, the, the first week I get done with the race, I'm trying to figure out a way to wear this thing. I'm literally walking around my house in board shorts with my belt buckle on. I'm like, I earned this thing. I need to represent it every time I can. And you wonder like, how does that relate to me? Here's a, here's a picture of me actually finishing it. I look a little bit too happy for just running all through the night, but I was stoked because I accomplished it. And you think, how does that relate to me? I'm not gonna run a 100 mile race. But I'm gonna tell you, you're having a journey. You're on a, a course. God's called you to run a race one step at a time. And when I first got into this, I was like every one of you. I hated running. Anybody relate to that? You're like, this is terrible. Why do I want to do this? If there's not something chasing me. Like, this is a dumb idea. In the very first mile I ever did, I ran with my friend Keith in my neighborhood. And that first mile felt like an eternity. It was like, is this ever going to end? And if anybody's a runner, don't worry. I was like a 12 minute pace on the first mile. And I later got to like, run like a six minute mile. So there's hope for you. You just gotta keep learning to get better. And right after I started running, Pastor Matt and some other friends, they were really into triathlon. And I was like, running's okay, but I want a cool looking bike like Pastor Matt has. And my friends, my friend Pastor Brian had one of these crazy bikes. The first time he pulled it out, I was like, dude, that thing looks like a science project. Like, what is that? It's like a, a astronaut bike. And it had this crazy tall beam. And Pastor Brian's a really tall guy. He's like, dude, when you're doing a 100-mile bike ride, this thing flexes, and it really helps protect you because you're not getting beat up so much, if you understand. 
And so I got into the idea of triathlon, and I was like, I want to do this thing. I was inspired by Pastor Matt. I was like, I want to get after it. Do you guys want to see me ride this thing? I might get hurt. Let's see. I want to see. Okay. So this is called a trainer. And when you need to get out there and do miles, you don't always want to be on the road because sometimes it was a, a 4 a.m. start. It was a riding five days a week. So you could get this special trainer that you could put in your living room and you put lots of towels on the ground because it gets very sweaty with no airflow. And you can just sit here and you can go mile after mile, hour after hour. And when we trained for a 100 mile bike ride and I was training for Ironman and getting ready, you're literally putting in 10, 20 hours a week in training sometimes to get ready for this race. And so you're just going one mile at a time. You can't think about the whole distance. You just gotta think about, I gotta do the next thing ahead of me. I gotta take this next sip of water. I gotta get this next nutrition. Give a hand that I didn't fall just then. Come on. I was very nervous about that. You can't get overwhelmed. And what's wild is that you spend all this time training for sometimes a race that may last an hour. Like, how silly is that? My wife's like, why do you do that? Like, I have spent hundreds of hours of my life to train for this moment that leads up that some of these races, one of my favorite races ever was the 5K I ran last January that I finally got a goal. But it's under 20 minutes for this time that I'm like, I spent hundreds of hours. But it's the same way in your life. You guys have trained for this. You joined Freedom a few years ago and got free of some bondage of the past and got set free so you could help other people for such a time as this. You pressed into that Bible study to be able to learn more about God and know the plan he has for your life for this time. You started leading your family and training your children up in the way that they should go. So that way when we got into the hardest year of our lives, you were ready and prepared. You guys are doing the same thing. And I need to tell you to just keep going. Don't give up in the process. You might have gone through this year job layoff. Your marriage might have been through more strain than you've ever had. Your kids might have tried to go off the rail. But I want to say to you today, keep going. God has got an amazing plan. There's a definition here of the word strain. It says a severe or excessive demand on your strength, resources, or abilities of someone or something. That sounds like this year. This is excessive demand that's pulling on you. Can anybody relate to that? That you're just being pulled on? Or how about this definition of courage? Google says the ability to do something that frightens you. And there's many times that we have to do things in faith, that we have to step out. We don't understand, but we keep moving forward, taking that step. That you might have had the situation this year where there's more month than money. That you might have dealt with health complications. How about this election coming in two days that people are feeling anxiety and pressure? But you know what? We can trust God in the process, no matter what. Amen. There's a Bible story that ties this in so well. This comes in John 21. It's the last chapter of the book. And it's a story where the disciples and the followers of Jesus have kind of like, they've gone off the rails a bit. Peter, who was wanting to be Jesus' number one man, had betrayed him. He had left his life, the calling that he had felt like God had put on him. And you know what he did? He went back fishing. And I don't want to judge him. I love fishing. It's one of my favorite things to do. I don't know if he was fishing because he had just given up on life and that's the only thing he knew. I don't know if he went because he had to provide. He didn't have like Tai Tai or Publix to go pick up some fish for the family. Like maybe he just had to do it out of necessity. But this verse opens up. It says in verse three, then Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we'll also come with you. Come on, bad influence, Peter. They went out and got in the boat and that night, they caught nothing. But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know there was Jesus. So Jesus said to them, children, you do not have any fish, do you? They answered, no. Nope. And he said to them, cast the net on the right-hand side of the boat and you'll find a catch. So they cast and they were not able to haul it in because of the great number of fish. Now, I don't know what that feels like to you, but they were out all night, discouraged, beaten up. They had tried it their own way and it had come up short. But here, this guy's yelling from the shore, 100 yards off, hey, do the other side. And they're like, okay, this worked once before. If you know, in the Bible, this is the second time this has happened. 
And I don't think that it's a coincidence that Peter's first encounter with Jesus, when he got the calling on his life, is when Jesus said to do this, to throw it on the other side. He's like, you're a son of God. Like he knew that it was a powerful moment. And now God is using this to be able to redeem him and restore him. So I've got this cool video. I love to watch fishing videos. And this comes from Asia. But instead of finding like a fishing scenario where it's a commercial boat and they've got like the world's deadliest catch, this is more like one person casting a net. Go ahead and play that for me, Jordan. Now this is a guy with like a big 12 foot net, but I love this. He threw this thing out and he's like, what do I got? What do I got? And it starts here, you got some fish. But then he starts to get excited, just keep watching. I love it, and I love the sound with how pumped they get. His friend has to come in and start helping him, because he's like, dude, this net, it's about to rip. Got some big ones. They're about to get pulled over in the water. Dude, that's the kind of catch I want to catch. Look at that. Come on, that's awesome. I love it. And that's what it was like for them. We actually pick up in the story. It says, therefore, the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. So when Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped down for work and threw himself into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, for about a hundred yards away, dragging this net of fish. So when they got on the land, they saw a charcoal fire already laid and fish placed on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring me some of them fish, which you just caught. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land, full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. So here's Jesus on the shore. He prepared a place for them. He actually had already provided a meal and bread and was there waiting for them. But he provided for them and gave provision, said, hey, go to the other side. And I love Peter's enthusiasm. John was like, hey, it's Jesus. He's like, whoa, he just jumps out of the boat. He's like, if it's Jesus, I want some of that. And he goes on there, and this is a silly point, but John wrote this detail in there. He's like, and there was 153 fish. I'm like, bro, why does that matter? It's like, when you get to heaven, is there gonna be a quiz? They're gonna ask Brandon when he walks in, like, now Brandon, how many fish were there? And the second time that Jesus performed a miracle, it's like 46, it's like, go away, bro. Get it right. It's like, there was overflow, but really that's the way that Jesus is, is that Jesus prepared a place and he provided even more than they could need, is that Jesus was there for him. He saw them in that dark moment. Could you imagine fishing all night and coming up short with nothing? This is their job. It's not like they were like me and you going out and not knowing what they're doing. This is what they did for a living and they had come up empty handed. But when they listened to what God called for them to do, when they took that small next step, God provided. There's a verse here in Ephesians 2.10. It says, for we are God's masterpiece. He's created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the things that he planned for us long ago. You are God's masterpiece, guys. He's created plans for you that you don't even know yet. But when you take a step, you'll discover what that was. The second point from this story that I love is that Jesus knew their situation. He knew that they hadn't caught anything, they were discouraged, that they had tried it on their own, and he was still there. Can you believe that Jesus sees you when you're battling? And when you're going through that toughest moment is that he is there. Psalms 34, 18 says, the Lord is near to the brokenhearted, and he saves those who are crushed in spirit is that he was right there with them, even when they didn't realize it. The third point is that he provided a step. Now I love this one. Here were these guys frustrated and exhausted, and their breakthrough was literally the width of the boat away. This is not this huge fishing vessel. This was a small boat with a couple of dudes on it, and literally six, eight, 10 feet from just feeling distraught and like nothing was working and giving up and what am I doing with my life to just that distance, they were able to get this breakthrough. He says, cast it on the other side. And at that moment is when not just they caught the fish, but Jesus restored Peter. Peter got on track to become the leader of the church. God put him back in the place that he was supposed to be. And I've dealt with that frustration. I, I love fishing. I've been out before with my wife, and when I got my wife in the boat, I really want to catch fish, because I'm like, I want to show off some stuff I've learned. 
And we were out one day, we were fishing, and we weren't catching anything. I had live bait, I was using my secret spots, I'm trying everything and there's no bites. And I was like, you know what? Let's try something different. Let's go to this other side and try it. And we cast out this fish, same hook, same setup, same technique, and we ended up catching this fish right here, which was awesome. It's like, come on, Jesus. I was so stoked. Give a hand for that, for that big old fish, come on. You gotta cheer on a big fish when you see it. It was so cool just to see, and every time I fish, I'm like, Jesus, you did it for them. Do it for me, please. I need your help in my boat every time I'm out. And so this next point is that there was grace for their step. It was in that step of faith when they stepped out that Jesus was there with them. And they realized this idea is that Jesus was the only one that could have done it. This was not a regular catch. This was a catch that was so big that just like the first time, Peter was like, it's the Lord. That's what made him jump out of the boat. He's like, God is here with us. And I've experienced this in my life. Anne Marie and I have had things in our lives that felt like such a small little step that turned into something so much more. There was a season where I was a part of my dad's small business. It was a multi-million dollar company with about 30 employees. And I stepped out in faith. It was very scary to leave that to go into full-time ministry. And I didn't realize that the timing was terrible. It was 2006, 2007. And you guys know the, the housing you know, economy blew up. The housing market blew up. The economy went terrible. And they were, I was the last person hired. I was the first one they had to let go. And I just felt so discouraged. And we tried to move to Jacksonville to be in full-time ministry. It never materialized. We tried to sell a house. And it was just like we couldn't get it to work right. And we ended up at East Coast in 2009, feeling kind of beat up, just like, God, what's next? And we were able to sit and rest and be healed and restored. And it was on a Wednesday night service that I so clearly heard God say, hey, I want you to serve in kids ministry. And I'm like, what, Lord? And in my mind, this is broken. Is I thought, God, I've already climbed this ministry ladder. And I did quotes because this is stupid. Is I was like, God, I did youth and young adults, and adults, why are we going back to kids? Like, come on, I've already done that thing. I'm with the grown-ups now. And he's like, shut up and listen to me. Go be with the kids. And I'm like, all right, Lord, you're smarter than me. And even that step was so small. I wasn't like, hey, I want to take over kids. I was like, hey, I want to serve one time a month. And that wasn't even a thing. It didn't exist. They're like, you got to serve every week. I'm like, no, can I serve once a month and just kind of get back? And they're like, we'll make an exception. And it was that little opportunity. By the way, you can serve once a month now. We would love for you to serve anytime, any place. We changed that rule. Pastor Matt and I went, what? Let's change this. Come on. And so that one time a month materialized. And Pastor Matt called me weeks and months later. He's like, I need you to come down to Vieira. We have a need. And I need you to take over our children's ministry. And it opened up a door where I took over kids and I took over the intern program. I took over the youth ministry. And God opened up more and more opportunities over one small step that seemed just so insignificant. And I know that God can do that in your life too. Jeremiah 29, 11 says this. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future is that God has amazing plans for you, just like he did for Peter. You don't understand them all the time, but God is doing it. And I want you to key into this, that especially in 2020, know that God isn't doing it the same way. God wants to do a new thing. Our youth ministry for East Coast is called TNT, or the new thing, and it comes from this verse, Isaiah 43, 19, it says, see, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Don't you perceive it? I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. And God wants to do a new thing in your life. When you feel like God's given up on you or you gave up on him, that broken dream, I want to tell you today, pick up that dream. Pick it back up and know that God wants to redeem and restore that fallen thing. God still has an amazing plan for you. Don't give up because he hasn't given up on you. Come on, guys. God is good. The final point I want to make is that Jesus invited them closer. So when they came to shore, Jesus said, hey, come and break bread with me. Come and do life. And he wrapped his arms around Peter and he redeemed him. He restored him. He put him back in ministry. And God wants to do that for you. You might say, hey, it's not that easy for me, Pastor. You know, I'm dealing with a marriage that's under more stress than it's ever been. I know that, guys. 
There's been more attack on marriages this year than ever before. You might be dealing with a, a crazy teenager or a kid that's going sideways, but know that God is there with you. And when I first started training for triathlon, I got my running shoes here, I got my goggles, my bike. I quickly learned this, is that you need to learn to get comfortable with the uncomfortable. One of the first things I bought was a good watch and a heart rate monitor. And I went with my friend Brian Moore, who loved to make me suffer. And we went to High Point Hill in Cocoa. It's the highest hill in Bavard County. And he's like, hey, you're going to run up this hill as fast as you can until you can't run it anymore. So like, well, that sounds fine. About the third one, I lost everything in my stomach. And I was like laying on the side of the road. I found out what 200 beats per minute feels like. And I was like, well, that's not fun. But the good news is I was able to do that workout again and again. And I trained myself to get comfortable with the uncomfortable. I did that run later, and I could do it minutes faster per mile. I could do it and get my heart rate down, and I could train myself. And it's the same way with you, is you can train yourself to overcome these situations that you thought, I can't do this anymore. And God's like, I'll provide the grace in everything that you need. I've got a video that we're going to show here, too, is that this is a special place in my heart. My, my 14-year-old son, Rhythm, has really gotten into surfing, and it makes me so proud because if you've never done it, surfing is very hard, and it's actually really scary. You don't realize it, but when you're paddling into this wave, it may just be three, four, five, six foot, the ocean pulls back, and sometimes you can see the bottom, and you're falling over a ledge that's like straight down while you're trying to pop up. And over the last two years, I've seen him from letting all the waves pass, and he'd be scared, or catching them once they're already broken, to where now he's dropping into waves overhead and going for it. So here's a video clip of the greatest surfer of all time, Kelly Slater, keep playing it. You can see him throwing himself over the edge. And even here, watch when he comes out the back, he turns around and goes, what just happened? Like literally, he was blown away. Here's one more clip for you. Just going crazy. That's awesome, you can take that off. That's, come on for old guys, 47 year old Kelly Slater, making it look good making the 20 year olds, there's hope for us, Pastor Matt, that we can be looking like that when he's 47, is he's doing it. But rhythm learned to get comfortable with the uncomfortable. And as a dad, it makes me so happy. And God is that same with us, is that when your stomach goes up in your, your throat and you're like, I don't think I can do this, you can learn to embrace it. There's a quick story I'm gonna tell here as we wrap up is Warren Buffett, who's the greatest investor really in all of history, in 2020, he was worth $78 billion, but that's after he donated $37 billion of his wealth to charity. The guy's crazy. And when he was seven years old, he rented this book from the library called 1,000 Ways to Make $1,000. Buffett took these small steps, and he started out literally by selling chewing gum, soda bottles, weekly magazines door to door, just taking little steps. And as a high school sophomore, him and a friend invested $25 to buy a used pinball machine, which they placed at a local barber shop. Within months, they owned several of these machines all across Omaha. They later that year sold that business for $1,200 to a war veteran. That's in 1940, guys. Sold it for $1,200. It was just the little steps that Buffett took to be able to amass the greatest fortune that we've seen really from any investor. And Buffett says this quote, it's a great way for us to think. He says, be greedy when everyone else is fearful and be fearful when everyone else is greedy. He's trained himself to behave differently than the norm and to think differently. And I want you to do the same thing. Let's be like King David, who when Goliath was out there yelling and everybody was running away afraid, he ran to the fight and killed that giant and stepped into the plans that God had for him. How about this? How about the 14 people at East Coast that gave for the very first time last week and stepped out in faith to be able to do that? Put your hands together for that. It's for many of you, when you made that decision to follow Christ, that you're like, I'm gonna do it afraid, but I'm gonna do it anyways. It was me in 2001 when I surrendered my life to Christ. And I said, God, I'm gonna go all in and I'm gonna see what you have. And little did I know, each one of those small steps would turn into so much more. So that's our vision for East Coast is one more step. Whether it be easy or hard, I don't know what it is for you. What's that thing that you need to throw the net to the other side? The breakthrough could literally be as close as your breath, but to step out and do it 
and to do it afraid. Maybe for you, it's that you need to step out from the shallow water to go deeper into what God has for your life. Maybe it's stepping into a God-honoring relationship and out of a cycle of hurt and frustration and pain. Or maybe it's to mentor someone younger, to serve somewhere, to lead. Maybe it's to come back to leading. If you've been afraid and you're like, it's time to come off the bench. I've got a place and I need to step into that. Maybe it's a step into your finances to plant a seed and see what God will do when you trust him with your money. Maybe it's a step into freedom and away from bondage. I believe that today that you can take that step that will forever change your trajectory of your life. So every week, we love to provide this opportunity for you to be able to accept Jesus and to know him. And we've talked a lot here about overcoming fear. You know, I was afraid at times on that 100 mile that I was gonna fail and quit. I was afraid when I've had to step out of ministry. I was afraid when I followed Christ and I thought, what are people gonna think? But I wanna encourage you, do it afraid and just know that God's gonna meet you right there. If there's something holding you back, if the Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now and burning in your heart, or maybe you're out here and you're like, I've accepted Christ, I've done that. But I need to pick up that dream that I let die. I gave up on it. I need you to know that God has not given up on you. So we're all gonna say a prayer and I want you to be bold and repeat it after me. And don't overcomplicate this. In 2020, it's so easy to think that there's so much more to it, that we have to, you know, read our Bible first or get our life right. But Pastor Matt says that all the time, is that you don't have to know how to behave before you belong. Is you can come and just be welcomed home right now. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died and rose again, you will be saved. It's that simple. So we're gonna all say this prayer and I want you to say it with me and believe it in your heart. And whether you're saying it for the first time or you're picking up that dream, let's really mean it. Say, dear Jesus, thank you for saving me. I give you my life. I give you my dreams. I give you my next step. Thank you for loving me. I believe that you died and rose again and will be with me forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If that was you today, I want you just to be bold. Don't be afraid right now. You're in a room of people that will celebrate with you more than anywhere else in life. If you made the decision for the first time, just be bold right now. Throw your hand up and let us celebrate with you. We would love to say welcome home and welcome to the family. Is there anybody out there? Come on, guys, put your hands together right now. Thank you, Jesus. Why don't you bow your head? I'm going to pray one more time. We'll be closed. Father, I thank you for everyone here to be empowered, to know the next step that you have for them, and to be able to walk in. And we thank you for our new building and for the impact that we're making in Vieira, in our community, and around the world. In Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak. Amen. God bless you.